OK, let's continue. We are on page seven. Uh, here we have a unit about making generalizations. This is when you need to say something general, not specific, but in an, a general case, a normal case. And there are a lot of words here that you can remember. They basically mean similar things, um, but there are a few details that you should remember. So the first word, normally, it comes from the word norm, a noun that means uh, the regular, usual, or correct way to do something. So the word normal can mean regular, but it can also mean uh, expected or correct. So uh, we have to be a little bit careful with this word. Because sometimes we, we want to say that something is usual, but we don't want to say that it is correct. If you say that something is correct, that means that uh, other things might be incorrect. And sometimes we don't want to say that. Uh, so be a bit careful with the word normal and normally. The other words, um, so like generally and in general, these two mean basically the same thing. Typically comes from the word type. So like we say a type of thing or a kind of thing. Uh, this word originally, the word type originally meant uh, like um, when you use a computer keyboard, Right, you type the words. Uh, the word type originally meant the letters for printing. So like when you print a newspaper, the machine that you use to actually print inshua, the newspaper, uh, each letter is called a type. So you can see that uh, the word type to mean kind means that you use one um, specific shape to represent uh, a letter. So typical means uh, if you only use this specific shape and you don't need to use a different shape or a different kind. So the first four words are uh, generally speaking, so in most cases. Um, usually also means in most cases. And for the most part also means most cases. Let's see what else. Many, a lot of, most, uh, all mean in most cases. Then you have the words for a slightly lower frequency, so not as often. Sometimes, some, and a good number of. A good number of looks like it means many or most. But actually, if you use this phrase, in, uh, that mean, instead of using most, uh, that means it has a different meaning. It means not a few. So in fact, it means some, not most. Uh, logically speaking, most is more than many. And many uh, means a good number of and is more than some. And then if you want to move to a lower frequency, you have seldom, rarely, few. So these are not often. Uh, and then one more thing to point out. To eat out means to go out to eat, like at a restaurant. Uh, and at plus some kind of time. Any hour of the day means any time. 
otherwise you might say like I at nine o'clock or at two o'clock. But here it's any hour. Either way, a specific time you would use at. Because at points to a uh, specific point, whether it is a point on a map or a point on a clock. OK, let's uh, go to the next page. We're going to save this for the writing unit later in the semester. Uh, part F asks you to fill out, as it says here, to complete an application form for a visa to enter Canada. As you will remember from last semester's final exam, the word visa means the permission to enter a country, Qianzhen. So on the next two pages, we have a visa application form for Canada. I'm not sure if this is the latest one, because again, our textbook is kind of old. It says on the bottom, there's an ID number here. It ends 2002, so I'm guessing that it has been updated since then. Uh, so let's take a look at what kind of information you would need to apply for a visa. One thing you will notice is that this form is in two languages. Application for a temporary resident visa. This is, of course, English. Uh, resident means you live there, but temporary means only for a short time. The second language is French. Demande de visa de résident temporaire. Uh, it means the same thing, but Canada is a bilingual country. Uh, Taiwan, I guess, will soon also become a bilingual country. Um, so because there are two languages, um, it first asks you to choose which language you're going to use. English, Anglais, or French, Francais. Uh, we're going to stick with English because it's an English class. Uh, so on the top left, you have the agency responsible for the form, Citizenship and Immigration Canada. On the top right, you have a legal disclaimer. Uh, it says protected when completed. So if you finish filling out the form, all of the information here will be kept private, will not be made public. But this also means that if you do not finish filling out the form, uh, the government of Canada may have the right to publicize your information, to publish your information. Uh, that's what the language says. Not quite sure if that's what the law says. Page one of two, so there's a second page. Let's see, file. This is where the agency will write down the file number. So that's not for you to use. OK, and then the first big box is what kind of visa? Single entry visa requested, which means you only want to enter the country once. Uh, and notice that um, it could be singular or plural. The S is put in parentheses. Um, Because as we will see, you can also apply for a visa for your family members. On the same form. The second option is multiple entry visa, so you want to enter Canada more than one time. The third option is a transit visa, which means you want to pass through Canada on your way to somewhere else. Yes, even if you're just passing through, you also have to fill out a visa application. Unless your country is on the list of visa free countries or visa exempt countries. And I'm glad to say that Taiwan is on a huge list 
of countries that don't require us to have a visa for a short term stay, uh, and that includes transit passing through. Uh, you know, Taiwan's passport is actually quite good. We, we uh, have a lot of uh, good uh, visa free deals with uh, many countries. Next, uh, you have two kinds of people applicant. So this is you. Spouse or common law partner and children. A spouse is the person that you're married to. A common law partner is the person that you live with that you're not married to. You're like a long term. You're in a long term relationship, even if you did not get married to them. Uh, in English and American law, uh, they also recognize common law partners as a kind of spouse. I think there's a legal legal requirement to prove this relationship, but if you can prove it, you don't need to have a marriage certificate. So here's the information. Let's look at self uh, as an example. Family name, Xing. First name, Ming. Second name, in American English, we call this the middle name, Song Jian Ming. Relationship. So, of course, if it's yourself, then it's yourself. But if it's not yourself, you should put down uh, the relationship between the person and yourself. Sex. Date of birth. Uh, and you'll notice that it has a specific format. Day, it says D. Day, M is month, and then year. So, like you would put down, if it's today, you would put down 02, sorry, uh, 2402. And then two zero two three. This is the opposite order from the order that we use in Taiwan, right? In Taiwan, we say year, month, day. In Canada and in Europe, they say day, month, year. In America, they say month, day, year. So you have to remember that, uh, especially if you only see the short version, you don't want to get confused. Then place of birth. And then citizenship. So which country do you belong to? Then passport number. And then your passport expiry date. When does your passport uh, expire? When do you need to renew your passport? Um, usually, even uh, you have to renew your passport within six months of the expiry date. So, for example, if uh, your passport will expire today, then you need to renew your passport at least six months before. So you would have had to renew your passport at the end of uh, before the end of August last year. Usually, if your passport has less than six months left, countries will not let you in. Um, this is international custom. So um, if you're planning to travel abroad, make sure uh, that your passport is more has more than six months left. Next, marital status. In other words, are you married? Next, uh, for these other people in your family, will they accompany you to Canada? Yes or no? So in other words, are you traveling together? Next, the purpose of my visit to Canada is, so why are you here? Tourism, business, other. And if you say other, you have to explain somewhere else. 
Uh, it says below. Is there a space to explain below? No, I don't see a space. Very strange. Uh, for those of you listening online, uh, apparently somebody said that the microphone is not clear, but it sounds clear to me. So somebody was just testing the microphone. OK, anyway. Um, yeah, it says provide details below, but I don't see a space to provide details. Uh, maybe you just write it on the right hand side. Anyway, next question. How long do you plan to stay in Canada? So start date. And end date. Next question, funds available for my stay in Canada. How much money do you have prepared for your stay? Uh, and the unit is Canadian dollars. And you would put it here. Next question, my current mailing address. So where can you receive your physical paper mail? And it says, I know you probably can't see this, it says all correspondence will go to this address. The word correspondence just means mail. If you wish to authorize the release of information from your case file to a representative, indicate their address below and on the form IMM 5476. Uh, this means that if you want to let the government talk about your visa application, with somebody else, please add their address below. Uh, so you would add the address here. And also on a different form called IMM 5476. This form is IMM 5257, so it's a different form. Uh, then you would give your telephone number here and your fax number, Chuanzhen, here. The box on the right says my residential address, if different from your mailing address. So if the place you live is not the place where you receive mail, you should also add the address of where you live here. Uh, and then here it says, do not write in this space. This space is for the government to use. And it says here, officer. So the person who will be looking at your application will probably sign here. So that's the first page. There's still a second page of information that you have to give Canada to apply for a visa. This question. Immigration status of applicant in country where applying. So what is so uh, it, before entering Canada, you have to apply for a visa. Where are you applying from and what is your status in that place? Are you a citizen? Are you a permanent resident? Are you a temporary resident? Which means you're you're only visiting. Are you a worker? And are you a student? Um, so worker and student are their own kinds of identity because some countries give you a special visa to work and a special visa to study. Uh, so these two uh, identities would be different from a uh, temporary resident. Uh, and um, 
if you are not a citizen or a permanent resident, you also have to note how long you are allowed to stay in that country. So this is the day you have to leave that country. The next box. My present job. Give the job title and a brief description of your position. So you have to say what your work is and what you do at your work in this box. On the right, name and address of my present employer or school. So what is the name of your company or the name of your school if you're a student? Next box. Name, address and relationship of any persons or institution I will visit. So when you go to Canada, uh, who or where, like a uh, company, do you plan to uh, visit or work with? Uh, and it asks you to give that information, the name, the address, and relationship to you. So like if you're visiting a family member, you would say like the family relationship. If you're visiting like a friend, you would say friend, that kind of thing. This, I think, is to prove that you have an actual plan. That you know the someone there and you know them well enough to have their address so that the Canadian government will know that you're not just um, doing whatever, but that you're in Canada for a purpose. Then you have a list of uh, security questions. Have you or any member of your family ever? And on the right it says X the appropriate box. So not check, go, it's X. Uh, yes or no, they're all yes or no. So the first question is, been treated for any serious physical or mental disorders or any communicable or chronic diseases. So have you been seriously sick in body or mind? Uh, the next question. Have you ever committed, been arrested or charged with any criminal offense in any country? So yeah. Have you ever done anything illegal anywhere in the world? The third one, have you been refused admission to or ordered to leave Canada? So in the past, have you tried to apply for a visa and been rejected? Or have you entered Canada and the government has asked you to leave? The fourth one, have you applied for any Canadian immigration visas? Uh, for example, permanent resident, student, worker, temporary resident, visitor, temporary resident permit. So like this is to apply to enter Canada, but have you also applied for any other kind of permission to stay in Canada? The fifth one. Have you ever been refused a visa to travel to Canada? Again, have, like so have you applied for a visa before uh, to Canada and been rejected? And the last one. In periods of either peace or war, have you ever been involved in the commission of a war crime or crime against humanity? Such as willful killing, torture, acts upon enslavement, starvation, or other inhumane acts committed against civilians or prisoners of war or deportation of civilians. OK, have you ever committed a war crime? Or crime against humanity? Uh, and below that, this box, it says, if the answer to any of the above is yes, give details. So 
uh, it's not like if you check if you X yes, you will automatically fail and not get a visa. It lets you explain what happened. Uh, and also, please note that this is a government form and it is illegal to lie to the government. So if you lie on this form and the government finds out, they can charge you with a crime. OK, next box. During the past five years, have you or any family member accompanying you lived in any other country than your country of citizenship or permanent residence for more than six months? So it's asking about you or your family members that are traveling with you. Have they lived anywhere outside of where you're coming from for more than six months? And it's asking for the past five years. Uh, well, not where you're coming from. Any country outside of where you are a citizen or where you are a permanent resident. If you've lived anywhere else for more than six months within the past five years, it says list the countries and length of stay. So uh, what what's the name of the country? Sorry, what's your name or, or the name of the person? Because it's asking about you or your accompanying family members. So the name of the person, the name of the country, when you entered that country and when you left that country for the past five years. Uh, and then the last question, 14. I declare that I have answered all questions in this application fully and truthfully. Uh, and, and then you have to sign your name and then give your give the date when you signed. This is to make sure that if you do lie, the government can use this as evidence against you. Uh, and then below that we have some legal information. This form has been established by the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. The information you provide on this form is collected under the authority of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act to determine if you may be admitted to Canada as a temporary resident. It will be stored in Personal Information Bank CIC PPU 051 Foreign Temporary Resident Records and Case File. It is protected and accessible under the Privacy Act and the Access to Information Act. So just legal information. OK, so as you can see, if you apply for a visa, you will have to give a lot of information if your country does not have an agreement uh, for visa-free travel. This form was uh, written in 2002. I've heard that more recent forms also ask for information like um, your social media account uh, or email address. Um, or maybe like the your past annual income. Yandu uh, Soru. And uh, famously, the application to enter the US asks you, are you a terrorist? Now you might think that's kind of stupid. No terrorist would actually say yes. Um, but there was a news story. Some old guy uh, checked yes by mistake. And the government actually sent police to arrest him and interrogate him uh, about how he was a terrorist, which is just stupid. Um, but yes, that question is on uh, some forms. So if you ever want to travel to another country, um, you have you should prepare all of this information. And now you can understand why on the final exam last semester, uh, one of the questions for the writing prompt is, will you help apply for a visa? Because it's kind of annoying. Uh, 
Um, let's take a quick look at which countries we can travel to without a visa. Um, okay, let's see. As of 28 January 2023, we have visa free or visa on arrival access. So you can get there first and then apply for a visa to 146 countries and territories. So we are the 32nd best passport in terms of travel freedom which is not bad. Uh, so green are the countries where. Uh, OK, dark green are the countries that don't require a visa. Light green are the countries where we can apply for a visa when we land. Uh, like this color. Is uh, online visa. This color is visa available on arrival or online. And then this color, sorry, this color is mainland China where we have to apply for a special thing. So uh, that's not bad, right? Like, look, US, Canada, most of Europe. Uh, what is this, Chile? And also, I think this is Oman. If you ever want to go to Oman for some reason, South Korea, Japan, Australia, this is Malaysia, New Zealand. So like most of the places where you might want to go, we don't need a visa. That's pretty good. OK, um, let's go to page 11. Uh, this is the communication part. Uh, here, the textbook gives you some phrases you can use for giving suggestions and taking suggestions. Uh, and it says, so why don't we, shall we, we could, or a um, more informal way is let's do something. For accepting suggestions, you can say that's a good idea or that's a great idea. Yes, let's do that. Great. You can also say sure. And if you want to say no, you can say. Uh, instead of saying no, you can say yes, but. That's a good idea, but. I'm not sure about that. Or something else you can say is. I don't know. But you have to say this very slowly. If you say I don't know, that means you actually don't know. But if you say I don't know, that means no. Cool, so now you know how to do that. On the next page, you can practice. Um, let's look at these different suggestions. Uh, different scenarios. First one, your best friend wants to leave his job because of the low pay and too much overtime work. Jaban, uh, overtime, Jaban. But he or she needs the money and it's difficult to find a job. Suggest some ways to help him or her solve the problem. Number two, you're the boss. You need to improve your staff's English. What can you do to improve it? Get everyone into a meeting and discuss. Number three, your company made a profit of five million NT dollars. Suggest what to do with all that money. Number four, you have to design a new product for children. Suggest a name. 
Number five, you work in a store that is losing money. Suggest ways to attract customers to go into your store. Number six, you want to organize a surprise retirement party for your boss after work. So your boss is going to retire. He has worked in the company for over 20 years. He is a kind man, but no one knows him very well. Number seven, you are in a work group, but one of your colleagues in your group doesn't do anything. You think that this is not fair to the whole group. Give him or her suggestions on what he or she should do. Number eight, I think uh, here give the person suggestions. The person is uh, not the person not doing anything. It's the a regular group member. Uh, number eight, an employee wants to borrow money from your company, especially since his or her father entered the hospital very sick last month. However, you hear that he or she hasn't paid back the money he or she borrowed from another employee. You also hear that he or she likes to play mahjong. Make some suggestions to look to your employee. So I think. Uh, hmm. That that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? I think this should be make some suggestions to your boss. The person in control of the company. Number nine, one of your colleagues is interested in getting the position that is now open and available. Uh, so your colleague is applying for a job. The person who had that position suddenly left the company. You heard from other people that it is not a good job, although the pay is very, very good. So the this open job can make you a lot of money, but it's a terrible job. OK, we have nine situations here. Please grab a partner, choose a situation and practice giving suggestions and accepting or rejecting those suggestions. I'll give you 10 minutes. OK, let's continue. For this next speaking activity, we will be using pages 13 and 14. Uh, on page 13, OK, so here's the activity. Some foreign clients called you to say that they plan to visit Taiwan for a few days. And you have to explain to your clients uh, if it's a good time to visit, what can they do? And if it's not a good time to visit, when should they come instead? So this page is the calendar that you should use uh, to answer these questions. And on the next page, you have a list of clients. Now, I can't show you both pages at the same time. So when I'm introducing these clients, please choose one person, remember their information. Uh, and then after I introduce these people, I will go back to the calendar and you can answer the question. Uh, I will give you five minutes to prepare your answer. And then after five minutes, I will call on a person to share their answer with everyone else. Okay, so this activity is 
来回答，说他想来的那段时间选的好不好，然后可以来干嘛？我给你们，我到时候给你们五分钟准备答案，然后我会从点名单选几个人来分享答案。So this is page 13 and 14. Okay, first person, Mr. Tadao Nakimura from Japan. He wants to come in early February and he will stay for three to four days. He wants to go shopping for local products and he loves spicy food. The second person, Ms. Wanda Williams. Uh, I think I mentioned this last semester. This is Ms., not Miss, Ms. Uh, and it means that we don't know if she's married or not. Uh, Wanda Williams from the US. She wants to come any time in April for two to three days. She wants to buy traditional Chinese clothes loves to eat vegetarian food and drink all kinds of tea. Third person, Mr. Tai Hoon Kim from South Korea. He wants to come during the first or second week of October and he'll be staying for four to five days. He wants to buy some Chinese gold and he loves nature. Next one, Mr. Franz Heinemann from Germany. He wants to come from June 5 to 7. And he wants to know where he can get cheap computer software and watch a nice movie. Next, we have Mr. Joe Stapleton from England. He will bring his wife, his 18 year old daughter, and 10 year old son, and they will be coming anytime in February for three to five days. He's looking for anything that will be fun for his family. He likes to play golf and go swimming. And uh, for this answer, you can also consider the age of his children. Last one, Mr. Raymond Lee, Singapore. When he says that it's up to you, any time of the year is OK, but he will only stay for two days. And what does he want to do? Anywhere he can see a lot about Taiwan in one place in one day. And he also wants to spend one day experiencing a Taiwan holiday or festival. So. Have you chosen a person? Okay, so if you've chosen a person, here is the calendar. And I'll give you five minutes to prepare. You can also look at um, the earlier part where we talked about all the different things you can do in uh, Taipei, right? All of this stuff. You can also look at that on page on page six. Uh, which person did you choose? Like which number? The first one, OK. Uh, Mr. Nakimura will be coming in early February for three to four days. He wants to go shopping for local products, love spicy food. OK, early February, three to four days. So the first question, is that a good time to come? What do you think? Yes, no?
early February, so he can join like the Chinese New Year Lantern Festival, uh, Ren Xiaojie. Is that a good time for him to come? Yes. Okay. And he says he wants to buy local products, eat spicy food. So where would you take him? What kind of place? Like local products and spicy food. That sounds like a night market would be good, right? Yeah. Uh, night markets have lots of local stuff and lots of food. Cool. Great. Thank you. OK, let's move on. Uh, do we have a volunteer who wants to share their answer? OK, so let's move on. Listening. Uh, let's take a look at the questions first. Listen to the dialogue, so it's it'll be uh, more than one person talking. And then answer the questions. One, what countries do not give knives as gifts? Busong dao. Hang on, uh, I forgot to mention something. This word, retrocession, Taiwan Retrocession Day. This is Guangfu. Guangfu Jinianyu. Okay. Um, which countries do not give knives as gift? So we have eight countries, uh, seven countries here, six countries. Mexico, Moshiga, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Venezuela, Costa Rica, Gozadalija, Colombia, Colombia, and El Salvador, or Salvador, Salvador. Number two, why should you shake a person's hand gently in Thailand? Uh, so don't use too much power. A, you could break his or her hands. B, your hands may not be clean. C, it's a sign of respect and friendship. D, it's a sign that you are in love, although the both of you aren't sure yet. OK. Interesting. So D means that you love the person, uh, but you're not sure if the other person loves you. Number three, according to the dialogue. So based on information that the dialogue gives you, what are some things that Jordan, uh, Chaudan, and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, have in common? So what are some things that are the same? A, they are both Muslim countries with a lot of oil, Muslim Gojia. B, they are both very private countries. C, they are both Muslim and they celebrate the holy month of Ramadan, Zai Jie Ri. D, they think that bribes, Xing Hui, are an accepted part of life in the Middle East, Zongdong. Number four, a bribe is. OK, so I just gave you the definition, but this question is asking you the meaning of the word bribe in the dialogue, not acor just according to a dictionary. So a bribe is a, a gift that you return to the person. So a gift that you give back. B, a gift that is given to someone to get a favor in return. So when you ask someone to help you, you would give a gift first. C, a gift that is expected when doing business in Jordan. D, none of the above. Number five, which customs did Grace find interesting in her last stop? A, giving a gift in private. Uh, in private means uh, not in public. B, burning gifts in the office. 
C. Giving a watch instead of a clock. 送表不送钟 D. None of the above. Okay, let's take a listen. Cool. Um, okay, so let's look at the answers. Number one, which countries do not give knives as gifts? The answer is D, Costa Rica and Mexico. Uh, the dialogue tried to trick you. It said Mexico and Costa Rica. Uh, and the reason is because it is a sign that you want to cut off the relationship. Number two, why should you shake a person's hand gently in Thailand? The answer is C, just sign of respect and friendship. And again, the dialogue tried to trick you. It says uh, it shows that you are respectful and you want to be friends. Number three, according to the dialogue, what are some things that Jordan and Saudi Arabia have in common? OK, this question, you have to use a process of elimination. A, they are both Muslim countries with a lot of oil. The dialogue did not mention oil. B, they are both very private countries. Not true. In Jordan, Grace had to give her gift in public. So Jordan is not a very private country. C, they are both Muslim and they celebrate the holy month of Ramadan. This is true for Saudi Arabia. We know that Jordan is also Muslim. Uh, and the dialogue said that all Muslim countries celebrate Ramadan. So maybe it's C. Let's take a look at the last one, D. They think that bribes are an accepted part of life in the Middle East. This is not true because when Grace was in Jordan, her host did not want people to think that he took bribes. So by process of elimination, the answer is C. Number four, a bribe is... Uh, because the the fourth option is none of the above, we also have to do a process of elimination. So let's take a look. A, a gift. Well, actually, no, we don't. Um, in the dialogue, it said that um, Grace was not allowed to give a gift in private because her host did not want people to think that he was taking a bribe. She had to give her gift in public. So what is a bribe? It seems like a bribe is a private gift. Um, the closest option is B, a gift that is given to someone to get a favor in return. This is the dictionary definition of bribe. But in the dialogue, the key difference is private or public. It's still possible that after receiving the gift, uh, Grace's host would still try to help her. But he does, in that case, he does not call it a bribe. Uh, so the answer to this question is actually D, none of the above. Grace 
他必须要在公开场合收礼物，但不管是在哪里收礼物，他也许之后还是会帮 Grace 一个忙啊。所以，呃，对他来说，行贿这个字的定义就跟字典定义不一样。对他来说，是一个私底下收的礼物就就代表是行贿，但是公开收的话就没问题。所以第四题答案是以上皆非。And number five,、uh, which customs did Grace find interesting in her last stop? Her last stop was in Taiwan.、Um, so the answer is C. You're not allowed to give a clock. She did not mention giving a watch, but I think this answer is close enough.、Uh, if you think the answer is still too far, you can choose D. None of the above. Okay. Do you have questions about this one? Okay. Then let's move on to the next listening.、Uh, let's take a look at the questions. Listen to the telephone message. Ah ha ha! 电话留言 Do you guys leave telephone messages anymore? No. You guys just text. Okay, so let's look at the information that we need to know. A, where is the caller from? Sorry, one. Where is the caller from? A, Saudi Arabia. B, Arab Trade Office, 贸易办公室 C, an Arabian business. Two. What is the purpose of the call? So why is the person calling? A to provide information, so to give information. B to request information, to ask for information. C to schedule a meeting. C which day are offices closed? A Sunday, B Wednesday, C Friday. Four. What is one thing that wasn't mentioned? A. Working women. B. Office hours. C. Travel arrangements. Five. When would be a good time to schedule a meeting? A. Thursday at nine a.m. B. Monday at three p.m. C. Saturday at eleven a.m. Okay, let's take a listen. Okay, it's not working. No idea why. Fine, I'll play it on my phone. So we're doing、uh, this listening question. Listening B. Listen to the telephone message and answer the questions. Hello, this is Hamid Nurguani from the Arab Trade Office in Taipei. I am calling to respond to your inquiry about Arabian business practices. First, I would advise you to only send your male employees to conduct businesses. In Saudi Arabia, since it isn't common for women to work or hold positions of power. Second, you should know that the work week is from Saturday to Wednesday. Businesses are closed on Thursday and Friday. Finally, many offices are closed for a few hours every afternoon. Working hours are generally from 9 a.m. To 2 p.m. and from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. I hope I've satisfactorily answered your questions. Please contact me at 02-2882-5485 if I can provide any additional information. Okay. So, question one. 
Where is the caller calling from? He said that he is calling from the Arab Trade Office in Taipei. So the answer is B. Number two, what is the purpose of the call? He is calling to give information. So the answer is A. Number three, which day are offices closed? He says that the work week is from Sunday to Wednesday and that offices are closed on Thursday and Friday. So the answer is C. Number four, what is one thing that wasn't mentioned? A, working women. He said that if you do business in Saudi Arabia, please send male workers. Not that male, male or female. That male. Um, because it is not common for women to work or have positions of power. B, office hours. He mentioned office hours. C, travel arrangements. He did not mention travel arrangements. So the answer is C. And then question five, when would be a good time to schedule a meeting? Uh, so A, Thursday, no, the office is closed. Uh, and then B, Monday at 3 p.m. or C, Saturday at 11 a.m. He said that usually they take a break for lunch between 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, so the office is closed between 2 to 4 p.m. So B, Monday at 3 p.m. is also not a good time. So the answer is C. Do you have questions? This one might be a bit harder because uh, the speaker used an Arabic accent. Do you want to hear that again? Let, let's listen to this one more time. Listening B. Listen to the telephone message and answer the questions. Hello, this is Hamid Nurgwani from the Arab Trade Office in Taipei. I am calling to respond to your inquiry about Arabian businesses practices. First, I would advise you to only send your male employees to conduct businesses in Saudi Arabia since it isn't common for women to work or hold positions of power. Second, you should know that the work week is from Saturday to Wednesday. Businesses are closed on Thursday and Friday. Finally, many offices are closed for a few hours every afternoon. Working hours are generally from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. and from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. I hope I've satisfactorily answered your questions. Please contact me at 02-2882-5485 if I can provide any additional information. Okay, cool. Below, we have a tip for writing. This, I think, is a very good tip. Separate writing from editing. Write first and then go back to correct mistakes. Because writing and editing use two different parts of your brain. Writing is when you're generating ideas. You're trying to put these new ideas together. Editing is you're reading what you have and you're checking to see if it's correct or if it's uh, something you have to change. It's two different ways of thinking. So the the most consistent way to write is to first put your ideas down on the page 
and then later go back to fix any mistakes. If you have time, right? This is for regular writing. If you're doing exam writing, uh, I suggest you check for mistakes after every sentence or every point. Because in an exam, you may not have enough time. OK, that's the end of unit one. Do you have questions? OK, if you don't have questions, we're going to jump into unit three. This unit will be about negotiation, tan pan. So let's look at some of the warm up questions. You can think about these questions uh, to help you get into the mindset to prepare for this unit. Question one, which of the words below best describes the meaning of negotiate? A, discuss, talun. B, argue, zhenlun. C, persuade, shuifu. D, debate, bianlun. E, solve, jidre. F, convince, shuifu. And why? Um, I should point out that these two words, persuade and convince, are the same word in Chinese, but in English there is a small difference. Persuade means that you get the person to do what you want to do. Convince means you get the person to do what you want to do and to like it. So they don't just agree to do it, they also want uh, to do it. In their hearts, they also agree with you. Question three, what is the meaning of bargain? Is it the same as negotiate? Number five, do you like to bargain? Why or why not? OK, let's take a look at the reading. Negotiating a win-win deal. How do people negotiate? Negotiate usually means to discuss something because you want to have an agreement. Do you ever negotiate? Every day, people negotiate to get better prices for a pair of loafers, a new sedan, or a condo near the sea. This kind of negotiating is frequently called bargaining. Learning to negotiate is an important career skill, and many Taiwanese university graduates begin learning how to negotiate at their first office job. Some of Taiwan's English language negotiations are not spoken, but done via correspondence. Some Taiwanese business people feel more comfortable with written negotiating because they can more prudently observe what their foreign counterparts are discussing. Other businessmen and women say that expensive long distance phone calls confine much negotiating to writing. Business negotiations once relied on the speed of the local post office or on expensive international traveling, but technology has greatly shaped the way businesses negotiate. Previously, most written negotiations were done via fax or facsimile. A case in point, Taiwan's once expensive long distance telephone rates were reduced by negotiations between Zhonghua Telecom and AT&T, a US telecom firm, in 1993. 
almost all of this negotiating was done by faxing messages across the Pacific. However, in recent years, faxed negotiations are in decline as a result of the convenience of email and instant messaging. In 1999, over 21% of Taiwan's residents, over 5 million people, were already internet users, most of whom also used email. By the time the new millennium began in 2000, most of Taiwan's written negotiations were predominantly done through email correspondence, which has the advantage of attaching large proposals, spreadsheets, and digital photographs and video. There are many circumstances in which spoken negotiating is necessary. For example, when a company needs to meet a deadline, maybe within 24 hours, even email is not fast enough. Everyday office workers, travel agents, engineers, and many other people must pick up the phone and quickly negotiate a win-win deal. Prices for some types of goods and services change very quickly, sometimes within minutes. So spoken negotiating is critical to get the best deal for your company. Furthermore, just reading an email is not always very persuasive to a reader. Spoken words with the right nonverbal communication can often be more effective. Everyone has different ways to negotiate and their own strategies to get the best deal. But almost all strategies need to include the virtues of patience and determination. Success takes time and a strong will to do your best. What's your secret to negotiating? Do you have your own style for getting a good bargain? OK, let's take a closer look at this reading. A win-win deal. In Chinese, we call this shuang ying zhi mian. Uh, let's see. It gives you a definition of the word negotiate, to discuss something, to get an agreement. Um, here, there should be a comma here. Every day, comma, dodian. Uh, every day, people negotiate to get better prices for objects, for products, when they buy something. So here are some things that they might buy. A pair of loafers. These are a kind of shoes that you wear um, in everyday life. They show xianxie, loafers. A new sedan. A sedan is a four door car. Or a condo. Uh, a condo is short for condominium. Uh, and it means something like an apartment. It's any kind of home that is not the entire building. near the sea. So when you buy shoes, when you buy a car, when you buy a house, uh, many people will negotiate. Uh, and then it says this kind of negotiating is called bargaining. So when you're asking for a better price. Then it tells us that uh, um, negotiation is important in your job. So this is true for any job, any place where you work with other people, being able to negotiate well will always be a good thing to know. 
Um, but then it says that many college graduates in Taiwan only begin learning how to negotiate at their first job. So it's not something that many colleges teach you. It's one of those things you have to learn after you go to work. Notice this uh, grammar, begin doing something. You can say begin to do something or begin doing something. Both are correct. Uh, and then it's this next paragraph talks about English language negotiations. Right, the previous paragraph uh, just introduces the general idea. The second paragraph focuses on English negotiations, and it says that in Taiwan, a lot of it is not spoken. Instead, it's written. Via correspondence, we just saw this word correspondence means mail or over a long distance. Not that mail, like mail as in the post office. To send mail. Yeah, that mail, OK. Uh, again, this was this textbook was uh, written in 2003, but even so at the time. Um, email and instant messaging had already started to appear. But first we're talking about uh, older kinds of long distance written communication. Um, let's take a short break and we'll continue looking at this reading when we come back. Um, we were on paragraph two. It says that most English negotiation in Taiwan is written. Because Taiwanese business people feel more comfortable using written negotiation. Because they can more prudently, which means a carefully. Carefully considered. Observe what their foreign counterparts are discussing. A counterpart is the person that you talk to to do business. Um, so Taiwanese businessmen like written negotiation because they can read what the other side is thinking. Other businessmen and women say that they like written um, negotiations because long distance phone calls are very expensive. The word confine here means restrict. Uh, so expensive long distance phone calls confine negotiating to writing. In Chinese, we would translate this as uh, 谈判受限于长途电话很昂贵，因此多半用写的。So confine 受限于呃，受使什么受限？呃， uh, confine or restrict. The word confine also can mean uh to detain a person, to to um keep a person from going out. 白一个人拘留。Um, so this is talking about written, right? But then this sentence gives us even older information. Once means in the past. Relied on the local post office, Yoju, or expensive international traveling. Uh, but technology has greatly shaped the way businesses negotiate. To shape here means just to have a big influence on. And then greatly just means to have a it's a big influence.
Um, and so this last sentence talks about technology making business negotiating easier. The next paragraph gives us an example of technology making business negotiating easier. Previously, so in the old days, written negotiations were done using fax, chuanzhen. Fax is an abbreviation of the full word, which is facsimile. The chuanzhen fax is suojin, zhenzhen is facsimile. Um, facsimile, we can look at this word simile, right? This looks like the word similar, something that looks very similar. Fac, F-A-C, this is from Latin and it means to make. So a facsimile is to make something similar, which is exactly what a fax machine does. It takes the information and it prints out a page with the same information. A case in point means for example. Uh, so it says in 1993, Taiwan's long distance telephone rates, rates is uh, fei the amount of money you have to pay to use a service, used to be expensive, but were reduced by negotiations between Zhonghua Telecom, Zhonghua Dianxing, and AT&T, which is a US telecom firm. Telecom Dianxing is short for telecommunication. Communication, you guys know what that is. Tele means over a distance. So a telephone is talking over a distance Television is watching over a distance. So telecom, telecommunication, is communicating over a distance. Firm means company. So it's saying that AT&T is America's Um, so they negotiated to reduce long distance phone rates and almost all of this negotiation was done by faxing messages across the Pacific. The Pacific here is the Pacific Ocean, Taiping Yang. Um, but in recent years, because of email and instant messaging, Fax negotiations are in decline. Uh, decline means to go lower. So it's talking about a graph. Right. If it's going lower, that means there's less and less. In 1999, over 21% of Taiwan's residents which is over 5 million people, 500,000, were already internet users in 1999. That's a high number. Uh, and most of these people used email. In the very early days of internet, email is one of the few reasons that people use the internet uh, because it was so convenient to be able to talk to people all over the world. Uh, in the next year, the new millennium, Qianyin, we know that uh, for every hundred years, we call it a century. For every thousand years, we call it a millennium. I think it's, is that spelled wrong? Let me check. Yes, it's spelled wrong. <laughs> The word millennium has two ends, but here it only has one end. Should have two ends. Uh, so by the following year, most of written negotiations were done through email. The word predominantly just means most. 
So most of Taiwan's written negotiations were mostly done through email. Why? One reason is because of this advantage. You can attach stuff, such as large proposals, tian, spreadsheets, baobiao, and digital photos and videos. So that's something you can't do with a fax. Spreadsheet, this word is quite important. More and more people in business use spreadsheets to do many, many different things. So you should know this word, Bobbyon, spreadsheet. Uh, but even though most Taiwanese business people like to use written negotiations, there are many circumstances or situations in which spoken negotiating is necessary, where you still have to pick up a phone and talk to someone. When you need to meet a deadline, uh, the word here is meet, to meet a deadline, maybe within 24 hours. Even email may not be fast enough. So everyday office workers, travel agents, we talked about this last semester. Engineers, and many other people must pick up the phone, pick up the phone and quickly negotiate a win-win deal. Uh, so that's one example when you have a short amount of time. The next example, Prices, jaga for some types of goods and services. Goods, something, services, fu can change very quickly, sometimes within minutes. So if you want to buy these products or use these services, you might need to pick up the phone to negotiate the best price. Spoken negotiating is critical. Critical means very important to get the best deal for your company. Um, it's talking about goods and services, but I'm also thinking about stocks, piao, right? The price of stocks also moves very quickly. You might need to uh, pick up the phone or use an app, Yong app. So that's the second example, when prices change very quickly. The third example, sometimes just reading is not very persuasive to a reader. Like when you read something, you don't get the feeling, right? You only get the information. So if you want to persuade the other person, if you want to do a good negotiation, spoken words with the right nonverbal communication, can often be very uh, can often be more effective. We talked about NVCs uh, last semester. I think here it also means like the sound of your voice, the tone of your voice, uh, in addition to like body language. So yes, speaking with somebody can be more persuasive than simply writing to somebody. This is very true. That's why in diplomacy, people still travel all around the world to have uh, in-person meetings because talking to somebody face to face is always the most persuasive way to negotiate. Right, to be persuasive to somebody means to be able to persuade that person. Last paragraph. Uh, everyone has different ways to negotiate. And. Their own strategies to get the best deal. So where is the and cutting off? Uh, 
it's a noun, right? 它是名词 So we're probably looking for a verb. 在找动词 So it's it's built uh connecting here. Everyone has one different ways to negotiate, and two their own strategies to get the best deal. Right, so everyone has their own strategies. Uh, strategy, so there. But almost all strategies need to include the virtues made the of patience, 容忍啊，不对，耐心 and determination, 毅力 Uh, and then it explains why success takes time. So that's why you need patience. And it also takes a strong will to do your best. Will here means like you have intention. You want to do this. Your very uh, emphasis is on doing this. So that's determination. And then a classic ending strategy. Uh, a strategy to end the essay. Ask questions to the reader. What's your secret to negotiating? Do you have your own style for getting a good bargain? To get a good deal. To get a good deal. To get a good bargain. 达成好的协议或是讨价还价得到好的价格。Okay, do you have questions about this reading? On the next page, it gives you some further reading. If you want to learn more about negotiation, you can look for these uh, books and articles. Moving on, page 34. Vocabulary. Uh, so let's do these questions. Circumstance means situation. Correspondence means uh, mail. Sending mail. Mail. OK. Proposal, Tian, win win deal, a good agreement for both sides. Oh, yes. In a negotiation, each side is called a party. Ifang, a party. So, a win win deal is a good deal for both parties. Uh, and determination, ED. So, I will give you. Um, Five minutes to match the word to the definition and also answer the five questions. OK, let's take a look. The first word circumstance. This is for situation. So four is a. Uh, and this one fits C. In such a difficult circumstance, how can we succeed? Second one, correspondence is two, written communication, writing letters. Uh, and this one fits. Uh, a. Chinese culture emphasizes that your correspondence includes much courtesy. Courtesy means being polite, Li Jie. C, proposal. This one is the third one. A suggested plan or possible agreement. And this one fits B. Our customer rejected our proposal and sent a new one to us today. 
Number four, win-win deal. This one is one. A mutually satisfactory agreement. Mutual means both sides. Satisfactory means it makes people happy. So a deal that makes both sides happy. Mutually satisfactory agreement. Uh, and it fits E. This proposal is too one sided. We can't get a win win deal with this offer. Offer just means proposal. And the last one, determination, is number five unwillingness. So you're not willing to do it. Unwillingness to quit a goal no matter how difficult. Uh, and so this one is D. To succeed in these difficult economic times, companies must have a lot of determination. Economic, jingjida. Difficult economic times means that the economy is bad. Jingji bu jingqi. Okay, do you have questions about nouns? Let's do the verbs. We talked about all of these. Yeah, I think we talked about all of these. Uh, so I'll give you five more minutes. OK, let's compare answers. F, attach something. This is number eight. To add or connect a thing, especially in email. And it fits question B. She forgot to attach her document to her email to her boss. G, confine. This is number six. To limit or restrain. Uh, and this one fits C. Because Leonardo da Vinci emphasized careful details and realism in his paintings, statues, and designs, much of the art of the Renaissance was confined by his... That's not right, was it? Sorry, no. It fits D. Sorry, sorry. Because her company's email system was unusable for three days, Barbara was confined to calling their customers instead. So for three days, she couldn't use email. She had to call them. H, observe. This one is 10, to see. Uh, this one fits number E. In her research on Taiwan black bears, Heishong, Dr. Huang observes a group of bears in Nanto for eight months to study their eating habits, to learn how they eat and what they eat. I, negotiate, is to try to come to an agreement, to try to get a deal. Uh, and this one fits F. My boss told me to negotiate a better price with our supplier, going sang. To supply something means to provide something. So a supplier is the company that provides things, going some. J, rely on something means to depend on something, number nine. Uh, this fits A. The president relies on his advisors for many critical decisions. Advisors, gu wen, or zi sang. Uh, ren ren. Usually, it, it's, it can also be spelled S E R S. Um, okay. And K shape to number seven to influence or affect. This one is D. Oh, sorry, C. Uh, because the Leonardo da Vinci of a so Da Wen Shi. Emphasize details and realism in his paintings, statues, and designs. 
Therefore, much of the art of the Renaissance, Wen Yi Fuxing, was shaped by his style. So much of the Renaissance was influenced by the style of Da Vinci. OK, do you have questions about the verbs? OK, before we take a long break, I wanted to remind you that we have a makeup class on March 1st. From uh, the third and fourth periods at EE 210. So please come to the makeup class. OK, let's take a break. I'll meet you at the other classroom uh, for fourth period.